It may seem that Mumbai, or Bombay as it used to be known, is simply Indian bazaars of spices, local residents in bright clothing, and Bollywood, which broadcasts boundless happiness. But every day, India is much harsher than we imagine. And one example of this is the story of Raman Raga, a man who once held the entire nation in fear. In this episode of Histographics, we'll tell you all about him. The most terrifying serial killer, this is how Raman Raghav can be characterized. Everything about his actions was terrifying, from the motives of his crimes to his behavior during his arrest. However, that very fact has helped Raghav be remembered for decades and even become the subject of several books and movies. One of these films made residents of Mumbai and people in other countries once again talk about the Indian Jack the Ripper. On June 24, 2016, the film Raman Raghav 2.0 directed by Anurag Kasyap, appeared on the screens of Indian movie theaters. According to several sources, Rahman was a native of the small town of Tarunelveli in the south of India, but details about his childhood and youth are hard to find. The details of his life were not even known then, in the 60s, let alone now. Scraps of information allow us to deduce that Raghav had no formal education and for a long time lived as a homeless person. The murders, so feared by all of India, weren't Rahman's first crimes. Before becoming the night terror of Mumbai, he had already spent at least five years in prison. He earned the sentence for robbery and, according to some sources, for murdering his own sister. These sources claim that Rahman's insanity was evident even then. He first raped his sister and then killed her by stabbing her several times. And that was just the beginning of his horrifying career. In the mid-1960s, fear gripped the eastern suburbs of Bombay. In the period from 65 to 66, bodies were regularly discovered on the streets. The majority of them were found not far from the Central Railway of India, which passed through the city. The victims were mainly poor people. This was the most vulnerable segment of the population. Many people lived in temporary huts that didn't provide any protection, and some even slept on the street. Eventually, the police were able to determine that all of the victims had died from a blow to the head with a heavy instrument. But why had they been killed? What was the culprit's motive? None of these people could have possessed anything of any real value. The most the killer could get from them was a couple of silver rings. At that time, the investigators did not yet realize that material benefit was the last thing on the killer's mind. In 1966, according to various estimates, between 19 and 23 people suffered at the hands of Raga. Ten of them were lucky enough to survive, but the rest died on the scene. The survivors described the killer as a terribly thin man, but there was no more precise information than that. What's most interesting about this story is that in 1966, the Bombay police still managed to detain Rahman Raga. He had attracted the attention of law enforcement by aimlessly wandering the streets near the locations where the murders had taken place. The suspicions of the police should also have been raised by his past conviction, but lack of witnesses and any direct evidence at the time helped Rahman to avoid punishment. Without any evidence, the police released him, taking only the minor step of forbidding him from entering Bombay for two years. Where Rahman Raghav spent those two years is unknown, but once the prohibition period ended, he returned to Bombay to wreak havoc there once again. In 1968, bodies once again began to be discovered in the city. This time, the killer chose the northern suburbs as the scene of his crimes. The same poor victims living in huts or right on the sidewalk. The same method of operation, blows to the head with a heavy instrument. And the same lack of motive. Fear gripped the city. Every evening, the homeless, in a panic, would ask for shelter in shops and hotels. Bodies were found more and more often, and anxiety grew with every day. In the city, people even began saying that the killer was not quite human. Among the residents, rumors quickly spread of his supernatural abilities. Many asserted that the killer could change shape, appearing as a bird, a cat, or even a dog, and some believed that he was a visitor from another planet. It was at that time of widespread panic and endless terror that Ramakant Kulkarmi took over. Kulkarni had just taken on the role of Deputy Commissioner of the Criminal Investigation Department when he immediately found himself face to face with one of the most difficult murder cases. While the investigation led by Kulkarni studied the evidence and tried to figure out what was driving the killer, 
new corpses continued to turn up in the city one after another. A nighttime patrol of the streets was begun. About 2,000 policemen were sent out on these night watches, but even that wasn't enough to cover the entire city. Then troops of citizens came to their aid. However, these frightened and nervous local men couldn't always adequately assess the situation, and so the vigilantes often attacked and beat up anyone who seemed suspicious to them. Eventually, Kulkarni realized that the killings from 1966 and the events currently unfolding were linked together. But how to prove this? The policeman did not know. And where to look for the killer himself? In his search for answers, Kulkarni again and again looked over the case evidence including the testimony of the surviving victims from 1966, and it was the approximate portrait of the criminal, painted from the words of his victims from 1966 that eventually helped the police catch the killer. In August of 1968, one of the members of Kolkarni's team, Junior Inspector Alex Fialo, was standing at a bus stop waiting for his bus when a strange man caught his attention. Surprisingly, he fit the description of the criminal from 1966. The man was walking aimlessly in the street and his clothes were covered in dirt and bloodstains. And among other things, the man carried an umbrella in his hands. This immediately raised Fialo's suspicion since it had not rained recently in the South. When the policeman approached the man and asked where he had come from, the stranger replied that he had come from Malad, an area where murders had been committed and it had been recently raining. When the inspector began to examine the other objects in the suspect's possession, he found another important item, a thimble. Then all of Yalo's doubts were dispelled, since the day before, a tailor had been murdered in Malad. The inspector ordered the man to come with him, and surprisingly, he showed no sign of resistance. Ragov willingly went to the police station. Fingerprints taken from him matched those found at the crime scenes. Kolkarni's suspicions were confirmed. However, it turned out that the most difficult and strange part of the police investigation was yet to come. A search of Ragov yielded no information. He did not have the murder weapon on him, nor anything else that posed a threat. Only a strange assortment of items, soap, tea powder, garlic, a small piece of paper with numbers written on it, glasses, scissors, and a hairbrush. The first interrogations yielded no results as well. For two days, Ragov would not talk, the investigators began to understand that they were dealing with someone with a disturbed psyche. So they soon changed tactics. On the third day, one of the policemen asked Raman what he wanted. Without hesitation, he requested chicken. On Kolkarni's orders, the killer's request was quickly granted. Having eaten his chicken curry, Ragov made another request. This time, in addition to food, he asked for a mirror a hairbrush, and coconut oil. Having received everything he asked for, he leisurely massaged his body with oil, combed his hair, and looked at himself in the mirror for a while. After completing this ritual, he once again turned to the police, but this time with the question of what they wanted. The answer was predictable. The police wanted to know everything about the murders, and Ragov calmly agreed to show them all of the crime scenes and even the murder weapon. He told the police to get a car, a guard, and two witnesses, since according to him, that was what the law required. After that, the investigators, together with the killer, embarked on a terrible trip through the city. Raman indicated the locations where he had killed his victims and recounted the circumstances of their deaths. Men, women, even children had died by his hand. Ragov confessed to killing a total of 24 people, and that was only in 1966. While the police were examining one of the crime scenes, the killer went to some bushes and pulled out an iron crowbar stained with blood. It was this item that served as his principal murder weapon. Now the police knew of all the victims and crime scenes, and even had the killer in their hands. But the main question still remained unanswered. Why? When the police asked this question to Ragov himself, his answer was shocking. He claimed that, unlike other people, he was a representative of another world known as Kanun. Raman also referred to himself as Shakti, or power, the entire time, and kept saying that he killed people and orders from a voice in his head. According to him, the voice belonged to none other than Shiva, the supreme Hindu deity. Additionally, Raman was convinced that those around him were trying to lure him into homosexual relationships in order to turn him into a woman. For Raman, who was convinced that he was 101% man, 
this was another reason that he killed. His next belief was the idea that he was being persecuted by three governments ruling India, the British government, the Congress government, and the Akbar government. The criminal's strange behavior called for psychiatric evaluation by experts for almost an entire month from June 28th to July 23rd, 1968. Raghav remained under the surveillance of a police doctor. The verdict was surprising. The doctor claimed that Rahman was mentally healthy, but his answers to the questions of motive had not changed. Influenced by the result of the police psychiatric evaluation, Rahman Raghav was sentenced to death by hanging by the court of Mumbai in 1969. He was charged with 41 murders. However, shortly after the verdict was pronounced, Rahman's defense ordered their own psychiatric evaluation. A panel of three psychiatrists concluded that the accused suffered from chronic paranoid schizophrenia. As a result, his sentence was changed to life imprisonment. Rahman Raghav died in 1995 from kidney failure, but the shocking memories of him live on. Soon after Raghav was convicted, Indian journalist and writer Kushwant Singh wrote an essay titled Portrait of a Serial Killer. The story of this most strange killer also haunted the investigator Kulkarni. His book, Footprints on the Sands of Crime, describing the most difficult and unbelievable cases that he investigated was released in 2004. What do you think? Was Rahman Raghav really crazy? Or was he just pretending to be insane to avoid execution? Tell us what you think in the comments, and of course, like and subscribe to the channel.